uh, welcome back. Uh, so uh, now you have a special lecture, of course, to be given by uh, Dr. Omar uh, Magna Loiza from the Louisiana State University. And I'll just briefly introduce him. Uh, before that, I welcome Omar uh, to our discussion meeting. We are really happy to have him. Ideally, we wanted him to be here in person. And he also, of course, wanted to come here in person. But due to some technical reasons, uh, he could not come in the last moment. And we hope that we will, of course, have him in person later on sometime. But uh, of course, it's uh, also good that he has uh, agreed to give this lecture online. And let me just give a brief introduction of Omar. So Omar is, of course, leading the experimental quantum photonics group at uh, Louisiana, Louisiana State University now. He did his PhD from University of Rochester, and he has a wide range of uh, interest in quantum photonics, starting from quantum communication, communications to quantum state engineering, quantum meteorology, and of course, uh, quantum plasmonics, which is a relatively new field. And the talk, uh, the title of the talk uh, that you can read here, multi-particle inter, uh, interactions in plasmonic nanostructures is somewhat related to that. So we are very happy to have you here, uh, of course, online, Omar. So over to you, Omar, please. Thank you. And thank you so much for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, my research. Um, as you mentioned it, today I will talk about multi-particle interactions in plasmonic nanostructures. And this is a broad title or a very general title, but what I have in mind is something like this. So we fabricate nanostructures, we illuminate them, and then we use these nanostructures to induce some particular multi-photon interactions. <clears throat> so first, I would like to, to mention that this work that I will be presenting was performed in collaboration with members of my team. So here I show uh, uh, my team and, the, and in this work, uh, my postdoc, Dr. Chen Lung Yu, participated. Also, Dr. Ash Miller, Min Yuan, Fateme, and, and Manik. And in general, my group does, as, as, as you mentioned it, multiple things. So we work on quantum imaging. We shape some special modes of life for communication purposes and for metrology. We also work on quantum metrology with entangled photons to measure small physical parameters. We use nanostructures to shape the optical field. And recently we have been using photonic waveguides for quantum information processing. So we work on different fields. And this is like, like an advertisement, but uh, I'm taking two new students. So if you are interested in coming for a PhD, please apply to, to LSU. So now LSU is not requesting a year is, so only TOEFL, so it's relatively easy <laughs> to, to, to join us. Okay, one of the things that we do in my lab is we use information about multi-photon interactions to learn more about a quantum system. We do this by performing photon number resolving detection. And as you probably know, most of the detection schemes in quantum optics use click detection. So that means that if we have an optical field, we don't know the number of photons in that field. We just have a yes or no answer. We, we have a click if we detect a field or we have nothing if we don't detect anything. When one perform photon number resolving detection, we can estimate the number of particles that we have for that particular field. For example, here we have one photon in this detector and one photon in this detector. In this other case, we have two photons and we know that there are two photons there and vacuum in the other one. Or we can know if we have three photons in one detector and one in the other and all these possible combinations. So having this information allows us to see things that are not very evident. For example, here we have this gun and it seems like there's a body there, but we cannot see it, but it's there. Well, 
I like to think about photo number resolving detection like that. By doing by by performing these measurements, we can identify some dynamics that are not very obvious if you do click detection. And we have been applying these schemes for detection for multi-photon quantum systems, obviously, but also, also for sensing and metrology. And as I will describe it today, we have been using these schemes for, for detection to unveil some like matter interactions. And we're also interested in using this photo number resolving detection for quantum imaging. So we recently showed that by performing the detection, you can achieve super resolution. I'm not talking about that, but this is one of the things that you can do with photo number resolving detection. So one of the things that I would like to remind you is that there are different kinds of light. Probably the three most common are thermal fields. For example, we all know sunlight. This is an example of, of a thermal source of light. We're also familiar with laser light. So here we have what we or we we call that kind of light as coherent light. And then we also have single photon emitters. So there are multiple metrics or quantities that one can use to identify each of these sources. Probably the most popular is the Mandel parameter. So we can go and measure the Mandel parameter and we'll find that the Mandel parameter is positive. If you have a thermal field, we'll find that the Mandel parameter is equals to zero if we have a coherent laser. Or we can find that the Mandel parameter will be below zero if we have single photon emitters. So to do that, well, there are multiple ways in which one can do that, but one is through photon number solving detection. Also, if you have the Mandel parameter, then you can also estimate the G2. The G2 is, so, is known as the second degree of coherence. And then one can use the G2, actually they are related as you can see it here. One can use G2 or the Mandel par parameter to identify each of these sources. I'm mentioning these because what not the, one of the things that we do is to use these nanostructures to shape these photons and produce different photon statistics that we quantify through these parameters. So one of the one of the technologies I will say that we have been developing in my lab is building these quantum sources. So back in 2019, we use and we use an SPDC waveguide and we implement some kind of conditional detection that allows us to produce or to tweak the statistics of signal and idler. So in contrast to most of the sources where you generate two and correlated particles here, as you can see it in these experimental distributions, we can generate, we pump that waveguide, that nonlinear crystal, that we can pump that uh, nonlinear crystal really hard and produce multiple photons as shown here. So what we demonstrated is that one can implement conditional measurements like that. And then we can produce signal and idler with almost any statistics. And this is interesting because you can, for example, produce an entangled system among wave packets that look like lasers. For example, here the Mandel parameter is zero. So that means that signal and idler look like coherent states, but they can also be entangled. And we can also make the Mandel parameter negative or super thermal. So this is one possibility. And, and we also demonstrate that one can also control the strength of the entanglement. And I'm mentioning this because now we are using this source as our source for multiple experiments, and we can tweak the statistics and all that. So, oops, if we have this source, then that means that we need to be able to perform photon number solving detection. And we can, and actually this is uh, or the point of this slide. So the point of this slide is to tell you that we can also characterize these states and perform photon number solving detection. 
And actually, we recently reported that they got technique that allows you to build these histograms and to perform photo number resolving detection with only a few hundreds of data points. So this is remarkable because if you are performing photo number resolving detection, typically you need hundreds of thousands uh, of measurements to characterize a state. So in this technique here, we show that one can actually characterize any source of light using few measurements. And we were able to demonstrate that through, uh, through the use of machine learning. So I'm mentioning this because we have the source and we have the detection. And now in the rest of my presentation, I will talk what we do in the middle. What are the interactions that we exploit? And, and what are, what's the physics that we unbuild? So this is the cartoon that I have in mind. So in general, any quantum protocol can be decomposed in the generation. So you need an initial uh, quantum state. You need to be able to characterize it. But then in the middle, you have a transformation or an interaction. And it turns out that the complexity of this process scales with the number of particles that you have in the beginning and the paths or the way in which these particles can interact. For example, here we have three, three photons. And for example, here we have three paths. But even if you assume these three paths, we have different combinations of possibilities that we can detect in the end. And just to give you an idea, if you have three photons and five paths, then you might be able to induce up to 30 interactions, different interactions. Now, if you increase, the number of particles up to six photons. And this is something that we can do in the lab. In my lab, if we go back, we can detect up to say six photons with low probability, but we can generate them. And now if you increase the number of paths, you can have 7,000 different interactions. And this is really complicated. Actually calculating each of these interactions is hard. And where is in these ideas? for quantum simulation. I'm not talking about that, but this is basically our motivation. And then you might be asking, how is this related to plasmonics? Well, as I will show it in, 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 in a minute. So it turns out that we can increase the number of paths by using plasmonic near fields. And this is, and in the first part of my talk, I will tell you how we increase the number of paths using plasmons and then how we use these different paths to induce different multi-photon interactions that lead to different forms of light. And this is basically what, what I will be uh, describing. So to, to, to understand this, it's, it's always useful to, to remind you about the young double lead experiment. So if we have a source, and then if, if that little particle is passing through the lower slit, as we all know, we expect an intensity distribution of this form. If now, if the, oops, if the particle is traveling through the upper slit, we'll have another spot like that. And then if we just do this incoherently, we do this experiment multiple times, and then we do, Actually, we, if we throw the particle through the upper slit multiple times and then through the lower slit multiple times, we'll have an incoherent superposition of these two effects and we will just expect like a huge spot like the red one here. We'll know that, however, when we do this experiment coherently and we don't know where we throw in this, the, the particle, what we, what we will see is something like that we'll have this formation of interference fringes. And we all know that that can be described just by calculating the, the superposition of these two possible paths or these two possible waves. So the first term here will give you the intensity produced by the first slit. This other term will give you the intensity produced by the second slit. And then we will have an interference term. And then we can calculate if we want this interference term, just like that. Basically, we just rearrange this equation here. And well, this is not new. We'll know that this is in the textbook. 
But what about higher order interference, right? For example, here we have three slits. We can you also use the Born's rule to calculate that probability. And just because we are calculating the amplitude square of the wave function, then we'll have the following contribution. We'll have the three intensities coming from the three slits. But then we will also have interference between a slit one or a slit A with a slit B. We'll also have interference between a slit A and a slit C. And then we'll have interference between a slit B and a slit C. Then we, we might ask, well, what about what about a higher order interference? Why we don't have an interference term that describes an interaction between or among a slit A, B, and C? Well, we don't expect that just because we're calculating the square, but in theory, one should be able to estimate it if we just rearrange this equation like this. So we send all these terms to the other side. And then we can see if this difference is equals to zero, that means that this term is actually zero. And there is not such a term. If that number is different from zero, then it means that we might have this higher order interference term. So this, <clears throat> this was actually analyzed by, uh, by uh, Dr. Sinha. She uh, published this theory paper back in 2014, where she actually calculated and, and she said, this is one of the claims in this paper, that in fact, we can have something that looks like higher order interference because we have the presence of these loop trajectories. And actually she quantified, theoretically speaking, she quantified the contribution from this purple line and she basically calculated this, this, uh, this number. So she used uh, the Feynman path integral formalism and she calculated and she demonstrated that that path is actually very small. The probability of observing that path is very small, but there is a finite probability. So that means that the probability is not actually zero. So as you can see, when, if I go back to, to to the initial idea behind my presentation. So if we could use this additional path, we can induce more complex interactions. And that's why we are actually using these ideas because we have these extra paths and then we can use these extra paths to, for example, induce more complexity to the quantum simulation. So later after I read that paper back in 2016, we ran an experiment. So one of the things uh, that I thought is, well, maybe this loop path that were theoretically reported in the first, in the previous paper can be associated to the near field of the electromagnetic field. So as you probably know, when we do uh, diffraction, typically we say, oh, the far field, Distribution is just the Fourier transform of, of, of an aperture. And when you do that, you're basically neglecting the near field contributions. And I said, well, maybe if you keep these near fields, if you take them into account, these near fields can actually lead to these loop trajectories or loop paths. So we did an experiment and we say, okay, let's do the experiment, but now let's use a plasmonic or a metallic triple slit. And the, the special thing about this plasmonic slit is that if you illuminate it with vertical, vertically polarized light, that means lights polarized along these slits, you don't excite any near field. I mean, you will just have the natural near field that you expect in all the cases. But now if you rotate polarization, and now if polarization is oscillating in this plane, so you will ex excite a plasmon so in a plasmon, by the way, I didn't mention it, but it's just the coupling between electrons and, and photons in the surface of a metal. So you will excite a plasmon and that plasmon will enhance the near field surrounding this nanostructure. And actually you can see that there is a, that there is a plasmonic resonance. So for example, this is the interference pattern in the far field for different wavelengths. So you see that 
there are dark lines. Well, this is the plasmonic resonance. So clearly you can see that this nanostructure supports some plasmons. And then I decided to test if these plasmons can lead to these loop trajectories. And this is again, what we did in, in 2016. And one of the things that, that we show back then is that, um, so you can do this Feynman path integral and you can write it also like that as a superposition of multiple contributions. And it turns out that the straight paths are the paths that contribute more importantly to the interference path. But then when you enhance the near field here through the generation of surface plasma, you can actually have these other loop trajectories that you see here. And then these additional trajectories also contribute to the interference pattern, but they are like higher order effects. So I'm not talking about in detail about this work because this is all, all work, but I'm just telling you that these plasmonic nanostructures support additional interference path and that's what I want. And that's what we are looking for in, 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 in our research. And I will conclude talking about this paper just by showing you that we actually calculated the pointing vector for a case in which only this slit is illuminated. As you know, if this slit is only illuminated and there is no near fields around this nanostructure, what we expect is just a spot that looks like the dotted line. However, when we wrote it polarization, we excite these near field effects, we, pre, we excite these plasmons, and now we have some additional electromagnetic fields surrounding these structures. Now, if we calculate the pointing vector, we'll see that the electromagnetic field can actually be directed in this direction, then it can go back and then it goes back. So it, this will be act, an actual loop trajectory. And then when you have that, you will have the interference between a straight and a loop trajectory like that, and you will see the formation of fringes. And actually you can play with this. I should say that this calculation for the pointing vector is exact. So it was numerically solved using Maxwell equations or, or solved in my Maxwell equation for this kind of system. And you can clearly see that you can redirect this field along this line and then some of the arrows go in this direction and then you can have something like that. So you can play with all the multiple trajectories. So one of the other things that I should say is that by playing with the size of the slit, you can suppress some trajectories and you can boost other trajectories. So then this is very good because if we go back to the initial idea that I was describing, then now if I inject multiple particles to this system, then I can play with these near fields and this is what this plot is representing to induce a different uh, additional interaction. And this is, this is basically what, what we'll be exploring. Okay, so after, after we did that experiment, I, I, I became interested in the field of, of quantum plasmonics, even though we just wanted to understand what was the origin of these loop trajectories, then we found other interesting aspects about about these plasmonics. And one was the fact that the single slit, just one slit allows you to mimic a complex network in, in free space. So actually before I was working on this, I did most, and actually we still do free space optics and, and we work with interferometers and all that. And I was actually quite surprised to see that the transformation of a single slit is equivalent to what we call a treater. A treater is just a simple network or relatively simple network where you have three inputs. You have these three inputs and then you have three outputs. It's like, like, a, a, like, like a more complicated version of a beam splitter. In a beam splitter, you have two inputs, two outputs. This is very similar, but now here you have three inputs and three outputs. And actually here I'm, I'm, I'm writing the matrix, the transformation matrix for, for this case. So in this, in, in this diagram, B1 prime, oh, I think that I, I reverse the order, but let's say your inputs is a plasmonic field coming in this direction. 
then you can have a photonic field in this direction, and then you can have a plasmon in this other direction. Here you will have a scattering or multi-photon interactions. Can I ask a question more? Yes, 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 yes. Go, go ahead. Actually, all these operators, B1, A, and B3, do they have their they satisfy the commutation relations? Yes, these are bosons. Yeah, actually this, uh, yeah, this is very important. In a minute, I will talk about these bosons and, and fermions because actually we use this, this uh, platform to, to induce bosonic and fermionic interaction. But yeah, this for now, or, or at least in this paper, we assume that these were bosons. So a complimentary question. In beam splitter, you have to have the noise arm to satisfy the commutation relation. Here, you don't need any of that? uh mm, no well yes uh well it depends on how you understand that because uh here what we have is that each of these well it's actually included because each of these k vectors or couplings are actually complex so you have but yeah just like like in a beam split you have additional additional losses okay thank you yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So, well, yeah. So there, there are two pieces of information that 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 I wanted to mention. Mention one is that it's nice that a single slit can give you this transformation because then that means that you can implement a sophisticated and complex quantum network using this plasmonic platform. And this is the, the good part. The bad part is that, as, as you probably know, uh, plasmons are uh, lossy fields and then you have to deal with the losses but you have losses everywhere even if i mean we're working on different platforms that use waveguides and you have still losses when you when you couple or decouple and you have also losses in the chip so you have losses everywhere anyway so we demonstrated that and i and 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 i and i knew again about the losses but when i kept working more and more on this field, I realized that a lot of people used to claim that, that these surface platforms preserve both entanglement and photo number statistics. So, and, I, and here I just have some quotes. Then people used to say that, uh, yeah, that the statistics were preserved in these kind of systems, that basically all the quantum properties are preserved in, in the transformation between photon to surface plasmon to photon, because actually here we have a photon, then we have surface plasmon, and then we have photon back. So, and, and actually some people even demonstrated, I mean, demonstrated the preservation of two photon coherence and all these kind of things. And I'm not saying that that cannot happen, but the point, uh, that 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 or the idea that I had is that sure you can force your system you can force your system to preserve these quantum properties of coherence but that is not always the case. Sorry. Yeah, I have a question. Right. Yeah, so this interaction between B and A field, they are number preserving, right? Ideally, yeah. So then uh, the losses which you are talking, these are loss in only energy, not in the mode, no, the number of like total number of modes. The total number of modes is preserved. In this case, it's three, three input modes, three output modes. No, I'm saying that, uh, yes, total number, not that way. I'm saying total number of excitation in, uh, in all three modes. Like, are you using uh, rotating wave approximation in writing this coupling? Uh, yes, yes, yeah, yes, yes, we did. In the paper that's reported there, mm -hmm. but uh, but as I was describing it, due to, to the fact that these platforms are evanescent fields, then obviously the in reality, right? In reality, the the total number of particles or the conservation of particles. I will say that this, if the total number of particles is not preserved due to losses, experimentally speaking, right? And actually, that was quantified in 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 this work. 
But yeah. in the theory you are conserving, I guess that is what you are trying to answer, right? Right. Yeah, in the, the theory, yes. In the experiment, the, no. But actually, this takes me to my next point or to the next point in my in my presentation, right? That you can use these evanescent fields to shape uh, coherence and actually the quantum statistics of this of a multi-particle system. Okay. okay. Actually, th this is the reason why I'm 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 bringing these quotes to, or these uh, claims to your attention because our field. This is a very nice review, but in our field, like a lot of people used to think like that, that, okay, you write this kind of transformation with everything is, where everything is preserved, then you will expect that everything will be preserved, including entanglement, including photon statistics, inclu including quantum coherence. So what we show, what we demonstrate is that actually that's not, that's not the case. So and, and and I will go back to the initial to the initial diagram that that I use in, in my introduction. So if we have let's say these three different three different inputs, for example, this looks like a treater. So in this world, we only we only study one particle. We study one particle in three different modes. What we did now, or the new thing that we published last year is okay, now let's consider the fact that you inject three different particles and then you use these near field effects to engineer the scattering between these particles. And actually what happens is that we have more than that. We have a scattering between photons and then we have photon plasmon scattering. And then as a result of that, what you have is that these three initial uh, particles can be redistributed like that. So if your input was red, green, and blue, then one possibility is that in the output, you will have red and blue in this path. Then you will have green in the second path and probably you will have a vacuum state there, or you can have these other contributions. Now, what we're doing, if we, if we think like that, is we're basically reshaping the, the excitation mode, this is actually the excitation mode. We're actually reshaping the excitation mode of the field. And then if we're capable of doing that, of doing that, then we can re-engineer the field and its quantum statistical properties. And this is actually what we did. So I mean this, this conference is about spin orbit coupling. Here we don't have quite a spin orbit coupling, but what we have is a Hamiltonian of the following form where, well, here we have a coupling. This is just a strength or a constant. And then we have a nanostructure that is basically coupling the polarization mode to the photo number in this case. So this is what we have. It's very similar to the structures that I described earlier to the three path, uh, to the three slit uh, structure that I described earlier. So here we'll, we'll have one source, we'll have a wave packet because we have multiple photons there. Here we'll have another one. So this can be, I mean, this is basically a thermal wave packet as you probably know. So if we have SPDC, each, each of the signal and idler, if we go and measure the statistics of signal or idler, we'll have thermal statistics. So you can think about or you can consider a, a wave packet with thermal statistics. And we prepared this in an initial state that let's call it's diagonal. So later we change it, but for now let's consider that this initial state is diagonal. <clears throat> and then if it's diagonal one part, let's say the vertical part will just pass through the slit like the green line, but then the horizontal contribution will induce this loop trajectory that I was describing early. So you will have this possibility, this, this other possibility, or, or the combination of both. So this is what we represent here, that if we have a plasmonic structure like that, and we illuminate it with diagonally polarized light, some few will get coupled to the other slit like this, and then they will interact. So this can be described by this kind of, 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 of Hamiltonians. So now we'll have 
a wave packet with a specific photo number in source one, and then we'll have a, a, a different wave packet with, with a different brightness or number of particles in the other path. How do, we, how do we describe this system? Well, there are multiple ways in which one can do this. So one can use one can use the Hamiltonian that I was describing earlier. Uh, that becomes harder as you have more particles. One can use just by hand to calculate the interference of one photon with another one. Or you can use a statistical approach. And actually what we did is we picked this statistical appro approach. So we use a Glover Sudarshan theory of, of optical coherence and we use the P function. So in, in general, if you have, and I, actually this is described in these very nice papers, and we recently used them for, for these two, two papers that, that I'm citing here, so in general, you, if you have a thermal or, or a coherent field, you can write a P function for the coherent field like that with a Delta function, and you can do something similar for the thermal field. And in general, a general field will be, or will contain the contribution from either one of these two fields, right? You can have the contribution from a coherent system or the contribution from a thermal system. In reality, you have both. And if you have these contributing in an indistinguishable form, then you can calculate the P function by using this convolution. <clears throat> and then this is, this is very nice. You calculate the P function for the system, oops. And then if you have the P function, that means that you have information about the density matrix. And if you have information about the density matrix, you can use that to calculate the probability distribution that this is what we go and measure in the lab. So this is useful. Now, if you have distinguishable <clears throat> contributions, what you have to do is now convolve the probabilities. So this is the, the, the coherent description. This is, well, this is the indistinguishable description, I should say. And this is the, distingu the distinguishable scatter. Now you go and calculate the P function. Then from that, you calculate the photo number distributions. And then with that, you calculate the probability. So in reality, you have both. If you go and describe our double slit system that I, that I showed before, you will see that the final probability distribution is actually given by this expression, where you can see that the final probability distribution depends on the brightness or the number of plasmonic particles that you have or plasmonic modes that, that you have. And also that depends on the number or the photo number of your source. And that also depends about the capping and other things and other parameters, but the important thing is that the plasmonic near field is contributing to the final photo number distribution that we go and measure. And this is important because that will mean that by using this plasmonic field, we can, we can uh, engineer the excitation mode of the field and we could in principle create uh, different photonic states. The other important contribution is that if we can control the probability in this fashion, then we can increase or reduce the photon fluctuations or the particle fluctuations in this field. Now we'll talk about particles because in reality, what we have now is we have a plasmon that's a quasi particle and we have photons, so we'll just say particles. But then you can tweak by, by changing these two parameters, these fluctuations, and that could be useful, for example, for quantum for plasmonic sensing or quantum plasmonic sensing. So <clears throat> this is the experiment we did. So first we injected one source, but in general we injected two source, then we control the two thermal sources with, with, different, uh, with different mean photo numbers. We prepare the polarization state of them. We combine them on a beam splitter, and then we use that to illuminate the slit. So our sample looks like that. So we have some oil here, then we have gold, and then we have glass, <clears throat> sorry. And then we collect 
uh, the transmitted field using a microscope objective. And then we do photo number solving detection because we need to measure basically this statistic. <clears throat> And this is uh, this here we have some results. So first we did the experiment with one wave packet. So we just illuminated one with vertical polarization. In this case, we don't create any plasmonic field. So we don't have this additional trajectory. So we just have a spot that looks like that. Then if we start rotating the polarization of the field, little by little, we enhance the plasmonic, the electromagnetic field around the structure. And we start observing some interference and that gets uh, stronger as we make the field stronger. And these people have observed it multiple times and you can see multiple, multiple papers. But what's new or what, what or yeah, what, what was new about our result is that, well, when you go and measure the photo number distribution, you will expect in this case, a thermal, a thermal distribution because the field is thermal. And this is actually what you measure. So you can see that it looks thermal, but actually the G2 is very close to two, which means it's thermal. So if we start exciting these plasmonic near fields, what we see is that the G2 is not thermal anymore. Anymore, it's partially coherent. So this means that the that the uh, this means that the excitation mode of the field is changing. And actually, if you could probably know. You could go and do this experiment with the spatial light, but if you injected a thermal field, it doesn't matter what you do, you will get G2 equals to two. Well, in this case, you get something else. So that means here that we're inducing an anti-thermalization of the field from because we start with thermal, this is now subthermal, and then we can also thermalize it by changing the polarization and the number of particles. It can go from 1.5 to two again, and you have different combinations. I, I have one more question here. All right. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. These, these, these are in stationary state or they can change even in time because you are showing all the statistics, G2. Uh, because thermalization uh, problem generally is a time dependent problem, right? Right. Well, the uh, I, I will say that everything is, stat is static, of course, the time is progressing as we go, as we do the measurement, but, but I mean, there are times that can be associated. We didn't do it because that was the point of this paper. The point was to show that the statistics can be changed. And of course there is some propagation, right? For example, these are uh, propagating surface plasma and then there is some time going on right because the plasma has to be generated and it has to travel through the slit but in our detector we just rotate polarization and we measure so it depends I, i'm not sure if that's what you mean by time okay no because uh, I, uh, I, we, guess, we let, I will say we let it run we yeah, just i guess what you are saying that after relaxation of the plasma and the uh, your photon you, you are measuring right i guess Right, that's what I mean. And yeah, there's some dynamics going on that actually this dynamics is described by the previous equation. But for us in our experiment, we just rotate polarization and we measure. That's everything we did. Yeah. Okay. Because mm -hmm. generally the system which does not thermalize, they will oscillate or they will show the like the behavior which is not thermalizing by looking in the time domain. Well, here we, we mean by thermalizing. Okay, here the, the word thermalization means in, in the sense of the photon fluctuations of the field or the particle fluctuations of the field. So this distribution here is a thermal one characterized by a thermal G2. Mm -hmm. So when you excite the plasmons, mm -hmm. you decrease the thermalization or you attenuate the thermalization and you see that through this new g2 this is okay, okay. yeah this is what 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 we mean actually we we in the paper we say that if you go and read the paper we say this only probably in two paragraphs because again that's not the point of the paper but as i will describe it later this work was later highlighted in in nature physics and the person who highlighted he was suggesting that this could be used to study quantum thermodynamics 
I don't want to comment more on that because I don't know much about quantum thermodynamics, but yeah, at least we mean in the sense of the photon fluctuation. Okay, okay, now, now I understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. All right, then we, we measured the dependence of this, uh, uh, of this, uh, of the modification of the statistics as a function of the angle. We see that when we don't have the field, we have a thermal G2, the, I mean, the plasmonic field. And then as we start increasing the strength or the surface plasma around these nanostructures, we see that the G2 changes. Again, this is not a general behavior. This depends on the number of particles that you have interacting. But at least for this case, we see that as the strength of the near field changes, we see this behavior. So this theory line was, uh, was obtained using the previous equation that I show that we obtained using the P function uh, from Glover and Sudarshan. And then we, we ran a similar experiment just for completeness using different particles. But in this case, we injected two wave packets. And we saw the opposite. In this case, we start with with the thermal field when we don't have when we don't have the the the, the plasmonic excited, the plasmon excited. Then, as we increase the strength of the near field, that that's represented by this cloud, we see that the degree of second order coherence drops like that. And these are the distribution. So, I should say that. Uh, that the distributions are important, obviously, but the distributions can be changed if you change the particle numbers. What cannot be changed, and this is very important, is the G2. So the G2 is independent of the photon number. So it doesn't matter if you have a bright or an attenuated source, your G2 will be one number. <clears throat> and that's the important part. It doesn't matter how the, the probability or the photon number distribution looks, if you just calculate that number, then that should be independent on, on the brightness. So just keep that in mind. So as I was, uh, okay, I'm running out of time. As I was describing this after we published uh, our work, then it was uh, it was discussed in multiple places. But one interesting review was this performed by Professor Tame. It was published in Nature Physics. And he describes the possibility of using these effects for, for other applications. And actually one application is this uh, quantum thermodynamics. So my group doesn't do anything about quantum thermodynamics and we don't know much about it, but it will be good to, to understand this thermalization and anti-thermalization in the photon number basis and connect them to quantum thermodynamics if that can be done. So yeah, I invite you to, to read that. And okay, so before, I mean, and this is just to conclude, this is what we are doing and what we will be doing. So I would like to remind you that these plasmons are basically quasi-particles that result from the coupling to from the coupling of electrons to the electric field. And then as you probably know, there are multiple words in which they use these networks or these circuits to simulate bosonic transport or fermionic transport. Basically, you, you just see the, the, the shift in the plus or minus of the superposition. And even in the plasmonic, in, 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 the, plas, in the plasmonic community, people have been investigating this kind of thing. So they have shown, for example, Hongo Mandel, for bosons and fermions, and they do this or they achieve that by changing the strength of this plasmonic field. Another interruption. This previous. Oh, sorry. This one is the paper by Griffe. Is that group that 2017? Yes, this one. Right. This article, right? Yes, 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 yes. It's by the French group. This 2017 so, paper. So, yes. Third, third kind of uh, variable in the problem. Is that? Is that the one? Yeah, okay. Uh, sorry, okay. I, I just heard variable, but I, I missed the first part. No, that is that is what I'm saying, where they're saying that uh, absorption opens up another degree of freedom. That right, is right, right, right. Yeah, that's precisely the point, right? The claim in that paper is that these plasmonic near fields can be used as an additional degree of freedom 
to, for example, tweak or engineer this uh, Congo Mandel interference. That's very strict. That, that's, the, that, that's the goal of this paper. Our main concern, when at least what I don't understand, see, when mm -hmm. you have losses in plasmonic systems, their losses are not avoidable, right? So the moment you put in losses, your system becomes essentially non Hamishian. So how do you right? Uh, that's true, but but all this this system, even this that was performed in in a waveguide, is lossy, right? In reality, uh, all these systems are very lossy. For example, the coupling from this quantum system in free space to the fiber will be probably thirty percent. Same for the output. Then you have losses here, so you have you have losses everywhere, even in free space. Of course, of course. So what I know. Yeah. That, uh, all the experiments what have been done, they are basically your plasmonic, let's say, directional couplers or something. They mimic the Homo Mandel setup, the beam splitter setup, and then mm -hmm. they, do this thing, they couple in the radiation through a fiber to the plasmonic guides, and then show that this Homo Mandel dip survives. Is that quantum plasmonics? You show that with the plasmonic structures, also you can have non-classical features and non-classical behavior. Is that the uh essential idea of quantum plasmonics? Uh, well, in the sense of this all of this all review from 2013, yeah, some of that kind of work was reviewed here. Most of the work uh, was like that. Yes, most of the work was like that. I have a plasmonic structure, and still I show that Homo Mandel deep survives in those structures. So, my so I mean. At this point, I don't remember exactly who, who did that, but this was, I will say that the first related work to what you're saying was published probably in 2001. Uh, but, but, but I'm not sure because as you said, a lot of people have been doing this. So under different circumstances and the, under different conditions under different uh, nanostructures. So yeah, uh, and, and in general, I think that if you ask me, if people consider this a quant uh, quantum, quantum plasmonic research, I will say yes, because I have read multiple review papers like those that I'm citing that, that understand these contributions like that. So I will I will say yes. However, this right to be clear, this relatively recent paper is different. It's different in the sense that they are basically using this photon plasmon scattering to change the super the 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 initial superposition or the parity of the entangled field that they inject to induce one plasmonic or the other. So it's a little bit more than that. Okay, so anyway, so uh, going back to, to, yeah, motivated by, the, by this kind of work, then we said, okay, can we, can we use the same system? Because in the end, you just need the interference that it was mentioned between, let's say, two different possibilities. And then all the dynamic will happen here. Can you just use post selection? to isolate a specific dynamics. And then the answer is uh, yes. So this uh, recent paper we did, we haven't posted in archive, but for example, if you have the physics that I already described before in, in the talk, and you have two detector systems and you isolate, you, you have a complex wave function because you have multiple photons and you have multiple paths. So you have multiple interactions. Then, uh, can you just implement a post-selection scheme in which you kill all the different contributions and you just preserve some of them? For example, you post-select on four particles in this detector and one particle on the other. Well, it turns out that you can see very interesting effects. For example, if you do that, I'm just picking four and five because that's what we did in the experiment. So you can see like a correlation kind of thing. So you will see a peak that looks like, I mean, in the language of the previous work, this is like anti-coalescence of five particles. 
But then it's interesting that if you even reverse the order in which you post select, then you see like a dip, like a bosonic kind of thing. So this is, uh, I don't have time to go and describe that. I just have this, but this is one of the additional things that we are doing. We're post selecting, by post selecting, we're collapsing or projecting the complex wave function to some particular photo number events. And then we're isolating particular dynamics. The other thing that we are doing, and, and recently we post a theory paper in archive where we describe the quantum Van Sitter Sarnicki theorem. So now, well, for, for those, very, very briefly, I will just mention that the Van Sitter Sarnicki theorem tell us how the spatial coherent uh, changes upon propagation. And people have studied this for other kind of coherence, polarization coherence, and other degrees of freedom. So in in this work, we call it the quantum Van Sitter Sarnik theorem because we show that actually the photons and the excitation mode of the field can be reshaped upon propagation. And this is what this cartoon is indicating. So we we did some, we fabricate some, we're fabricating this ongoing research. This paper was posted in archive. And, but now the way in which we are implementing this quantum Van Sitter Sarnik theorem is using nanostructures with different orientation. And then by, by playing with this initial nanostructure, we can induce some particular couplings and this coupling changes upon propagation leading, leading to the modification of, of quantum coherence upon propagation. And we're working on that and we have some predictions. So the theory that we are using was already posted in archive and I hope to report the experimental results soon. But this is just like a consequence of the previous research that, that I wanted to describe to you today. And I think that I'm, on, I'm running out of time. So in addition to my uh, LSU team, this work or these works were performed in collaboration with Israel de Leon from Tech de Monterrey and, and Dr. Roberto from, from UNAM and supported by DOE in the Army Research Office and thanks for your attention and I'll be happy to take more questions. Uh, yeah, thank you, Omar. So the, uh, it's open for questions now. So for photon number resolving detector, we are using uh, transition A sensor. So uh, for, for some of our work we did for this, for this work, for this particular work, we use uh, uh, nanowire detectors. And what we did is we, we did time multiplexing. No. So some of our work, yeah, I should say some of our work uh, uses transition edge sensor from TSS from NIST. I, I did my, my my postdoc there, so we we collaborate them. But for this particular for this particular work, we use uh, we multiplex uh, nanowire detectors. So how uh, many actually, the recipe is three, four, up to uh, which number you can resolve using SNSPD multiplexing? Uh, yes. Yeah, so we we have to work. That's a good question. So we have to work with sources with a mean photo number below three. Yes. And then if you work within this range, the fidelity will be above 95%. So if you go brighter than that, your fidelity will drop. But on the other hand, if you have such a bright source, then there is no need for you to do, to do photo number solving detection. You just build the histogram from intensity measurement. Another question regarding G2 tau values, uh, where you are showing less thermal behavior. So what is the time in our, have you measured uh, G2 like intensity correlation also uh, instead of photon statistics? If you have measured uh, photon statistics, what is the time when you are taking uh, for photon statistics, which we are building? Uh, oh, that, yes, so the answer is yes. So in this case, we have only one detector as shown in this setup. In, in this other experiment to calculate the joint, the joint probability between arm one and arm two, we, we do for joint photo number detection. So, and we just count photons within 
uh, one microsecond. And, and then we just, uh, well, we, we just do statistics with that. We took many, we take many measurements within this time range. Yeah. Have you changed the time mean and seen uh, whether statistics changing? Suppose instead of one microsecond, you change to 10 microsecond or go to millisecond, whether statistics changes or it remains the same. Have you checked that? Well, yeah, we, we, we're checking that. And actually we are, uh, yeah, so we check that for the papers that we are doing. Now uh, I will tell you why we're checking time traces. I'm going back to this picture that I have here. So I showed that there is anti-thermalization or thermalization. So what we're, the reason why we're analyzing these time traces is because we want to see if there is any quantum chaos going on. And to do that, you need to do what you're saying, right? You need to take the time traces and see how these change, how these oscillate to study if there is something related to chaos going on. Any other questions? I have a question because it's quantum chaos now, right? So, uh, so you are saying about quantum chaos in the system? Uh, at this point, I don't have anything, but wh okay. what we're doing is this. So here, for example, to go from C and G, or let's say from G to H. So here you have a partially coherent distribution with a G2 of 1.5. So to go from here to here, you need to increase the chaotic fluctuations of this system. And we do that through these near field effects, okay. So then what, what we want to study, and we don't have any results, so I don't know if it will work or not, is, well, when you go from this transition or even from this phase transition here, is there any, quantum chaos associated to that system? The answer is, I don't know, that's why we're doing it. Okay, so no quantum but chaos. The, but, the, 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 but what I explain is the reason why we're starting this, right? Because the, 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 the quantum fluctuations are increasing. So the field is thermalizing. So we have more chaotic fluctuations in this system than in this. So this is, our motivation. No, so I'm saying quantum chaos itself or approach to quantum chaos itself can depend on this number conservation is there, total excitation number conservation is there or not? Uh, because at least we have seen- so well, in well, it, Yes, that, that, that's a good point. So in this system for the, for the reason that I gave, so obviously, for different strengths of near field, you have different number of particles because different strengths lead to different losses. Mm -hmm. So yes, so in this case, the number of particles won't be conserved. Yes. What we can do, what we can do is run this experiment for a given number of particles, and then run this again for the same number of particles given this con this condition for the losses. Okay, okay, very good. Any other mm -hmm. questions? Uh, in one of the slide uh, during experimental setup, you have used microscope objectives to focus at two different points. Uh, how this? is it? Yeah. Oh, right. So here, basically the reason why we have this beam splitter is to produce these two dots. And then and later we have just optics to demagnify those two dots to the two slits. basically two uh, beams uh, focusing. Right, right. So it here. So here you will have, let's say, an object after the beam splitter. You just re-image that two spots to your sample, and that's it. You do that by demagnifying the, the imaging condition. Yeah. Well, Uh, in the last experiment, you showed multi-photon state you are using for coalescence and anti-coalescence experiment. So how you are creating this multi-photon state? Uh... So this, for this particular, for this uh, field, uh, you, can, 
Yeah, so the, the input fuel is a thermal fuel. You can, you have two options. You can just use signal or, or idler from your source. Signal or idler will be thermal or you can use just a thermal field and connect it there. So how you ensure that it is a, a multi-photon? Uh, you do the number resolving uh, detection before the input? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Any other question? Uh, I have a question, uh, Omar. So uh -huh. it's to me that uh, the photon statistics uh, changes, uh, it become less thermal as you had shown uh, by coupling yeah. it to another channel that is the evanescent channel, right? The photon statistics that you showed changes due to uh, its coupling through the evanescent channel, right? Right. So the, right. Is it possible to uh, get non-classical uh, behavior using this channel, evanescent channel and all? That is G2 less than one, or do you need to do something extra? Yes, yes, yes. So yes, you you can. Uh, yeah, you you can. One, one. I mean, it's it's a tricky question because in, in yes, in principle you can, but you have to do that through post selection like, like here, right? So you have to collapse your wave function to or project the density matrix of this complex system to one particular outcome. And then if that projection is quantum, then you will observe these quantum features. Okay, thank you. So any other questions? So if not, uh, let's again thank uh, Omar.